Grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Please be seated. Remember the Sabbath day. To keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Maybe you prefer Deuteronomy 5. Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. You or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your ox or your donkey or any of your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. The Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. Now, it's important to note that in all of God's law, and in particular, these two commandments, there was something that was missing. There was no prohibition against healing. That was a pharisaical rule that had sprung up. Now, to give them credit, their hearts were in the right place, but they had missed the point. They were trying to make sure that nobody was doing any work on the Sabbath. And what's the work of a doctor? To heal people, right? We go to doctors when we're sick so that we can hopefully get made well. But like I said, they missed the mark, and they missed it by a wide margin. They missed it by so much that they were testing to see if Jesus had a splinter in his eye. Spoiler alert, if you haven't ever finished the Bible, he doesn't. He's sinless. And they missed the logs in their own eye. Which is why Jesus tells them not to think so highly of themselves. Because they might find themselves embarrassed later on. Now, an illness, especially a chronic one like dropsy, which is where the body retains water and often leads to heart failure and people being weak, it was seen as a judgment from God. To have dropsy or any chronic illness or disability like blindness, paralysis, seizures, etc., meant that you or your parents had done a very great sin against God and he was punishing you for it. And so, there's the very real possibility in that worldview that you are outside the salvation, outside the forgiveness of God. And so when Jesus heals people, he's not just physically healing them, but what's tied with that implicitly is that their sins are removed. They are forgiven. Now, what was the purpose of the Sabbath? It was to take time and rest. Both tellings of it, Exodus 20, Deuteronomy 5, it was to rest, to reflect on what the Lord had done. For the, because the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And what were you supposed to do when you rested? To respond to the goodness of God. To go to temple or go to synagogue, to worship, to offer sacrifices, And most importantly, to receive the forgiveness of sins. To have that, to be reminded that that which separates you from God has been removed from you. And now Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. And God doesn't stop working on the Sabbath. Man does. God rested from his labor of creating on the Sabbath. He didn't rest from his labor of keeping his creation going. Otherwise, on the seventh day, the story would have ended rather abruptly. And so this man was coming to God, this man with drops, he was coming in need. And yes, he had a physical need, 
but also in the minds of everybody there, he had a very real and present spiritual need. He needed to have his sins forgiven and he was going to the one that would address both. Now what the Pharisees didn't realize that they were just as much in need as that man was. We are just in much of need as that man was. For there is no goodness in us. How many times do we have to see our heroes put up on pillars just to fall down before we stop putting our trust in man? How many times must we fail before we are fully disabused of trusting ourselves, trusting in ourselves. We have no hope outside of Christ. And if Christ took a day off, well, there's a certain phrase that comes to mind. I can't save it from the pulpit, but it involves a certain creek and a missing paddle. Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Absolutely, of course it was, and it is. Because that is when God heals. That's when God heals us the most. The gathering of the saints around the word of God, the washing of the water, the eating and drinking of the bread and the cup, the proclamation of the forgiveness of sins. We are the sun and the ox that have fallen into the well in our desperate need of rescue just as much as those Pharisees were, so are we. And Jesus doesn't wait for tomorrow. He doesn't wait for a more convenient time. He doesn't tell us to call back next week and he'll see if he can fit us in on Thursday. No, Jesus comes to us today with healing. Our sins are forgiven today. We are given life to the full, that is eternal life, today. We are remade and reborn today. Today, you are seated at the lowest spot of the wedding feast, and Christ comes to you and says, friend, friend, come up here to the place of honor. And just like our Lord didn't wait in heaven, but came down to seek his lost sheep, guys, there's a lot of people that are lost and need what we have, need to hear the forgiveness of sins. The world is full of sin-sick people. Our community is full of people that are despairing, that are losing hope, that are quite frankly, they have zero clue that they were made in the image of a loving God, a God that loved them so much that he sent his son to die on the cross for them and desperately wants them to know the salvation that he offers in the name of his son, Jesus Christ. You might sit there and ask, okay, Pastor, you say this every week, but I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. I know that my neighbor needs to hear the word of God. I know that my coworker is hurting and needs to find a place of restoration and hope. you know that for 2,000 years, 2,000 years, that's two with three zeros behind it, the number one most effective strategy to quote unquote church growth has been the same. Nowadays we have studies and we have books and you can go to conferences, but it's still the same thing. And do you want to know what it is? Simply inviting them to church with you. Will you come to church with me? I don't know what to say, but God wants to speak to you, and I know there that he speaks. I know there that I am given hope myself. I am given comfort myself. I am given restoration myself. I am given peace myself. And I invite you to come with me and experience it and hear it yourself. It's that simple. It's a simple invite. And it might need to be an invite given over and over and over again. I didn't get into this with the children's message, but turns out we're really poor listeners. 
We need to hear things over and over and over again. So I invite you to go out and invite people to the wedding feast of Jesus. Invite them to church with you so that they may too be healed. Be healed of their hurts. Be healed of their wrongs. Be restored fully in the gospel of forgiveness and given the promise of life everlasting with him. In Christ's name, amen. Amen.